All right, all right. Listen up, listen up. This is the real deal. This is no sh. Another rope thing, another show in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore. A chance for stage folks to say hello. Another rope thing, of another show. Another job that you hope at last will make your future forget your past. Another pain where the ulcers go. Hi, and welcome once again to Simon Studio Presents. As part of our ongoing training for actors, writers, and directors in New York City and Poughkeepsie, the Simon Studio regularly does TV, theater, and film production. And we regularly use professional associates in these projects. And this year, the 10th annual New York International Fringe Festival presented an award-winning play that used one of our members along with associates from the profession an award-winning play by Dimitri Raitson, directed by Alexei Burgo, and featuring Robert D'Amato and our own Daniel Hendrick Simon. So the Simon Studio adapted it for television, and tonight we proudly present Dimitri Raitson's play, The French Defense. In 1960, Mikhail Tal won the right to challenge Mikhail Botvinnik for the title of the world chess champion. Botvinnik has held the world title for the previous 13 years. If successful, at 23, Tal would become the youngest world champion in history. I am Bad Vinyak. Bad Vinyak. Botvinnik, what you got there? Your wife pack you a little lunch? <laughs> what is this? Do you mind? Are you on some kind of medication? You're not going to have a heart attack on me when you start losing, are you? <laughs> you better drink your medication, Botvinnik. We need you healthy. Young man, there is your chair. Go and sit. When the clock says it is five, then you may move a piece. Then I will move my piece, then you, then I. When you are ready to quit, stand up, bow, extend your right hand. <laughs> then I will go home to my wife. I think she has theater tickets for tonight. <laughs> Psychological pressure from the great Botvinnik, the model Soviet chess champion. No emotions. Just follow the program. Hey, I was just reading in Pravda that you always arrive at a match right on the dot. They even quoted you. A routine of exactitude is the key to success. So what happened to your routines here? You're early. You don't worry about my routine, young man. Well, I'm not worried. You'll have all the time in the world for your routines after this match. Huh? In the retirement home. So let me ask you a question. You have what? Six minutes of being world champion left. <laughs> How does that feel? You've had the title since when? 
1950. You probably don't remember what it's like to lose, do you? Great champion like you. 1948. <laughs> I have been world champion since 1948. What's the difference? Ah! You, the future of Soviet chess? <laughs> How old are you? Old enough to be world champion. That old, I see. See, old man, you don't know what's about to hit you. I think the press said I was about to be hit by the tall locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here, from Pravda. This by uh, Chatillon. Most chess experts agree. In young Tal, the Iron Mike may have finally met his match. But Vinyak's strongly expressed but Vinyak strongly expressed defensive positions and finally worked out theoretical analyses are not likely to withstand Tal's unabashed attacking style, mm -hmm. his penchant for complicated positions, and quite frankly, his youth and vigor. <laughs> By the way, Chatillon, do you know him? Doesn't matter. At my 50th birthday party, he was checkmated by my grandson. Well, he's a little younger than you. He's just five. Whoa! And still, the world considers Chatillon to be a first-rate evaluator of chess talent. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe I should resign. Resign? <laughs> I'm going to play. And I'm going to whoop you for the whole world to see. Well, you sound pretty sure of yourself. I thought, Vinyak, that you were going to lose. It's a mathematical certainty. You have no idea how long I've waited for this day. I've studied all your games. I know how you play. I know how you think. And you know what I've learned? Enlighten me. I'm a better player than you are, Botvinnik. You're not in my league. You figured all this out without even playing me, just by studying my old games. Oh, you're a great chess player, Botvinnik. Don't get me wrong. Your defenses are fantastic. They're barely penetrable. But tactically, I can think circles around you. And um, why is that? I'm just smarter. God gave me more brains. God? <laughs> what God? This is the Soviet Union, Tal. There is no God here, or haven't you heard? <laughs> ah. yeah. Look here, my superior, intellectually superior friend. You are white. <laughs> Make a move. <laughs> well, you are predictable. What? On to e4. Hmm. I always win opening like that. Ah, must be the superior intellect. <laughs> are you going to make a move? Are you going to? Stand here and philosophize. I think uh, I'll make a move. Yeah. 
Which one of us is predictable, how about Vignic? You're playing the French defense. <laughs> well, I thought I should have to play my best line to even have a chance. Stop taunting me about Vignic. You don't fool anybody. A machine. You should be afraid, you know. If you had half a brain, everybody loses eventually. Even you? Yeah, eventually, I guess. When I'm old, like you. When you're old, like me. It's two years. What? The difference between 1948 and 1950. It's two years. Yeah. Do you know what it takes to be world champion for two years? How about for 12 years? How about for two minutes? <laughs> Listen to me. You want to be world champion. You have to learn to show respect. In the last 70 years, there have been only seven of us. Six, if you don't count that critten Smyslov, who took the title away from me for a year when I was so sick I almost died. <laughs> ah, and think about their names, Tal. Steinitz, Lasker, Capiblanca. <laughs> they were not men, they were giants. When I was your age, I would shake in my shoes if I just heard those names. Steinitz, Laska, they're all dead. I've studied all their games, and guess what? A second-rate club hacker from some backwoods in Odessa could beat them today. Capablanca. <laughs> you think you know what it's like to play a man by looking at some old games in a historical text? Yes. You think you know what it's like to sit across the board from Capablanca by looking at some diagrams in a book? Tal, you had to picture him walk into a room dressed so beautifully in his dark banker suit, his shirt so white, his collar perfectly starched, and his hair always slicked back, and never, never one out of place. <laughs> <laughs> he was not a big man, but my God, how he could fill a room. <laughs> you would take one look and immediately you would know this was Jose Raul Capiblanca world champion. <laughs> and think about that name. Jose Raul Capiblanca. And for 10 years, Tal, 10 years, he lost only one game. <laughs> one out of hundreds. He was unbeatable. <laughs> and you know why? Because we were all scared of him. That's the truth of it. Oh, we admired him, but God, were we scared. If you thought you saw a weakness in his position, would you dare to attack, or would it be a trap? <laughs> Maybe he was just luring you in. <laughs> Most of the time, the game was already lost before you made your first move, because he was Jose Raul Capiblanca, world champion. You think you can understand that by looking at some old games in a book? Ha! Ah. Make a move. Say, Raul Capeblanca. <laughs> what do I give a shit who he is? If he was here, he'd be just another asshole who thinks he could beat me. <sighs> Look at yourself. 
You want me to look at you and see Mikhail Badvinyak, world champion, to get down on my knees, kiss your feet, and worship you. All I see is an old man who's played his best chess decades ago. Now, maybe you were the best in the world once, whenever that was, before the automobile. <laughs> but Badvinyak, I know exactly how you play. You build your defenses with reinforcements behind the lines of reinforcements. And then like a giant black spider, you wait. And at the tiniest weakening, you pounce. But I have studied every French defense you ever played. And it's not going to work against me. Look, you're leaving me way too much room to maneuver. Of course I knew that if you chose to exchange your king's bishop in response to my queen to g4, you'd bring out the f-pawn. Just like you played against me so often in 54. Am I right? Of course I'm right. Of course I'm right. But Vinyak, I'm in your head. Come on, I'll save you the thinking. Knight to e7. Come on, I dare you. <laughs> That's right. Now queen takes pawn. Now you go rook to g8. Come on, there's nothing to think about now. Queen takes pawn. Now you take the pawn on d4. Come on, just like you played against me, Sloth, in 54. It's your best line here. King to d1. Now you go knight d to c6. I go knight to f3. You bring out the f pawn. And then come. A little surprise. <laughs> What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? You did not play knight b to c6. <laughs> what do you take me for, an idiot? You, you played this line against me, Sloth, in 54. And then again in Leningrad, two years later, you beat him both times. <laughs> Smyslov was a fool. <laughs> I knew he would jump at any opportunity to position his knight in the center, whatever the cost to his queenside pawns. <laughs> the man lacks all imagination. He still doesn't see that it was a losing move. <laughs> and for that matter, neither do you. Am I right? Well, well, you've analyzed all my games, especially those two against Smyslov. What's your analysis of knight b to c6? Oh, you saw that that was my best move here and that I would use it against you. <laughs> Am I missing anything? Well, Am I? Dum dum da dum 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 da dum. Rump bum 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 bum. Rump. Didn't think so. It doesn't mean anything. What? It doesn't mean anything. What doesn't mean anything? That I missed it. You're still missing it. <laughs> what am I missing? <laughs> what you are missing, my intellectually superior friend, is that if the world champion allows your queen to roam freely and pick off his pawns, you might consider that he has a reason for doing this. And if he makes you such a present, you should think before accepting it.
Oh, Tal. Tal, Tal, Tal. I am disappointed. Clearly, knight b to c6 is not my best move here. An intellect as superior as yours should have spotted it. Okay, all right. So you're a little bit stronger on the queen side. Oh, is that your expert opinion? <coughs> okay, also in the center. But I can still cause you problems on the king side. Yes, if you can first defend yourself against what's coming on the B and C lines. We'll see. Oh, yes. Yes, we will. We'll see. Check. Ah. Oh, attack, attack, attack. Oh, attack, attack, attack. <laughs> attack, attack, attack. Attack, attack. Vladvinik, stop all this and just play chess. <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> Jack. You think you're out of it? I am out of it. Not yet. <laughs> I don't get it. You made an inferior move against Mislav in 54 when you were defending your title. On purpose. Are you insane? <laughs> you think that's insane? You risked your crown. My crown! How do, you, how do you think I've stayed world champion for 12 years? Do you think you become champion and that's it? You're done? Winning the crown is only the beginning. Because the day after you win it, you have to start proving to everyone that you can keep it. Defending the title, Tal, that's the true test of a champion. Because now, they'll all be coming after you. Oh, yes, everyone goes after the champion. That's yes. right. <laughs> the champion. He's like the giant red star at the top of the Kremlin. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Everybody's watching you. Analyzing every game you play. Every move you make. <laughs> eh. ah. Hmm. Ah. You, Spassky, Kiris, Smyslov, all of you, you're all gunning for me. You all want my crown. And that scares you. It annoys me. <laughs> Every single thing I do is dissected and bored into. Ah. How many hours do I sleep? How often do I practice? They study me like I'm some chimpanzee in a cage. Here. Tell me, Comrade Badvinik, do you believe that by arriving at the match exactly on time, it gives you a, a psychological edge? <laughs> or just two days ago, from the German reporter. Ah, tell me, hey Badvinik. Is it true that during training you have yourself hypnotized in order to attain perception of invincibility against your opponent? Hypnotized? Tal, these stupid questions, they never stop. Yes, the life of the great champion. Oh, and I bet you think that's some great prize. I give my right arm to be world champion. Why? Why what? Why do you want to be world champion? But Finnick, no disrespect, but it's an idiotic question. <laughs> of course it's an idiotic question. Unless it comes from the world champion himself. So tell me, why do you want to be world champion? Because right now, today, 
I am the best chess player in the world. <laughs> am I amusing you, Batvinik? <laughs> Look at him. He plays like a crazy man, wins a few tournaments, and now all of a sudden, he's the best chess player in the whole world. A few tournaments. <laughs> I beat everyone <laughs> to be here. Luck. Luck. Of course. Well, you know what everybody says. Dal. He doesn't work hard enough. Doesn't study. Doesn't prepare. Even my coach, Koblenz, is always yelling at me. Study your theory or you'll never be world champion. Mm. Well, fuck theory. It's instinct. I can smell what's really going on on the chessboard. So go. Read all the books you want. You still won't see half of what I can see. It's a gift I have, Vadvinik. So. Get it? Well, that's what makes me the best. <laughs> you think that you deserve to be world champion because you have some gift? But Vinyak, I've just <laughs> told you something I've never told another soul. You, of all people, should understand what it is to be better than everyone else. So don't mock me. I, 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 that's what you're saying. No. What I'm saying is when the first piece is moved, and it's just the two of us across the board, hmm. I can't be beat. <laughs> You'll be beat here at the rate you're going. And stop these inane questions and let me think. Oh. Think. Think. Be happy. It's your move. What's the matter, Tal? Things aren't going so good? Things are going fine. Because it somehow appears you're still a little pressed here on the queen side. You just make your moves. So isn't it the same for everyone? What? You want to be world champion to prove that you are the best. There was more to it than that when I first challenged for the crown. What's more important than proving that you are the best? <laughs> Staying alive. Staying alive? Mm-hmm. Staying alive. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a long story, Tal. Your move. <clears throat> I have time. Things were very different when I first challenged for the crown. <laughs> you know. Stalin, he was a big chess fan. <laughs> His favorite joke <clears throat> was the Potsdam Conference, the one <coughs> with Truman and Churchill. He said it was like playing chess with a child and a senior citizen. <laughs> he called the takeover of Eastern Europe his Polish gambit. Anyhow, Stalin wanted a Soviet world champion. He wanted to send America and the rest of the world a message. The country that could produce the world chess champion would ultimately outsmart, outthink, and outmaneuver 
everyone. <laughs> but imagine his luck. The best players in the country are Jews. <laughs> Me, Bronstein, Kiris, Levin back, Everfish. We could have had a minion at the Soviet championships every year. <laughs> Stalin wasn't happy about it. He didn't trust Jews. <laughs> In those days, Jews would just disappear. People would go missing so often that if a friend disappeared, everyone would just roll their eyes at each other. Doctors, generals, actors, even chess players. <laughs> but know what one person would never disappear? The world chess champion. So yes, 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 I wanted everyone to know I was the best, but I needed to stay alive to protect, to save my wife and kids. <laughs> Ever wonder how you would play? With a gun to your head? Exactly like I always play. The better player should always win. <laughs> the better player? <laughs> I'll tell you a secret, Tal. Yeah. Most chess players, even the best ones, don't really get chess. Ah. Oh, they get it. They think it's about opening strategy or maximizing peace mobility or some other nonsense. Yeah. So what do you think it's about? It's a game, Tal. Chess is not about mating the king. It's about defeating the person. When I was your age, the better player was not the one with the superior intellect. It was the one with the colder blood and bigger balls. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Today it's easy, attack, attack, attack. But we, uh, we couldn't play like that. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't smart. <laughs> I know one thing. Attacking works. Builds pressure. Gets people off balance. Like you said, it's a game. When attacked, people make mistakes. <laughs> Not everyone makes mistakes. Nearly everyone. When there is enough on the line. Not the world champion. Everybody loses Batvinik. Eventually. Your move. third game last year in Yugoslavia against that uh, American kid, uh, Fisher. That was a terrific attack. <laughs> I really loved your pawn sacrifice on C5. I don't think Fisher ever saw what was coming. You really liked it. You analyzed that game? Goldberg, my coach, he's been sending me your games for years. He said you would challenge me one day, and he was right. And so what do you think about my game? Hmm. I think it's brazen and irresponsible. And brilliant. Your constant attacks and sacrifices, <laughs> they shouldn't work against the top players. And yet, here you are. I can't believe you've been studying my games. 
Oh, Tom, how I envy you to be able to play with so much abandon. <laughs> Players of my generation, we, uh, we don't play like that. We can't. Why? Oh. It's uh, growing up with Stalin when you spend every day of your life living in fear, waiting for that knock on the door. It uh, seeps into your blood. You play to survive because you live to survive. <laughs> Thank God it's different today. Stalin is dead. I thought you said there was no God here. <laughs> play. You talk about pressure, but I'm the one with a lot more to lose. You? If you lose, the worst that you can be for the rest of your life is an ex-world champion. If I lose, I'll be just another joker who challenged for the crown. But Vignic. How many people challenged Capablanca for his title? Nobody knows. Because nobody ever remembers the runner-up, do they? Hmm. Here's a game for you. Guess what words I heard the most in my life, as far back as I can remember. And, and don't think it was my mother telling me to button my coat or eat my vegetables. <laughs> no, no, that'd be for normal people. The words I heard the most in my life, as, as far back as I can remember, is, it's, it's actually just one word. Mm. One. Are you going to guess? It's Badvinyik. You are the next Badvinyik. One day you will play as well as Badvinyik. Even when I became Soviet, Champion, it was one day you will beat Badvinyik. Badvinyik, Badvinyik, Badvinyik. My whole fucking life was about being you, as, as good as you, and, and better than you. I'm a good player, Badvinyik. But if I don't beat you now, the whole world will say, Tal, he had talent once, but he's no Badvinyik. <laughs> Tal. Your life is not over after this game. You're 23. You really don't get it, do you? It really is now or never for me. Be honest. This is the end of your career. Steinitz, Lasker, Capablanca, none of them played much past your age. If I don't beat you now, who knows what tomorrow will bring. Maybe you'll lose to another challenger, or maybe you'll just retire. Don't you see? I, I, I need to beat the great Botvinnik. I need to beat the Iron Mike. He who is blinded by ambition and climbs to a place where he can go no higher must thereafter suffer the greatest loss. What's this? Capablanca. <laughs> Machiavelli. It's from the prince. So now you're quoting old philosophers to me. <laughs> we all have a lot to learn from those who came before us. Don't you agree? I'm not here to learn. I'm here to win. You think, at worst, I will leave here an ex-champion? Huh. Can you see the headlines? The baton has passed. A new era in Soviet chess has begun. 
Young Tao takes the crown from a decrepit Botvinnik. <laughs> you think decrepit is nothing to lose? To have everyone look at me as a relic? <laughs> Chess is not kind to its aging ex-champions. Steinitz dying penniless in a mental institution. Lasker playing well into his 60s, but not winning anything. <laughs> Even the great Capi Blanca in his later years, <laughs> a mere shadow of his former self. <coughs> I saw them both in Moscow in 1935. No one was afraid. Oh, we were all very respectful for who they once were, but not for who they had become. So don't tell me I have nothing to lose! <laughs> but I'm just talking. This game is not lost. I still have some good chances. You see, everybody makes mistakes when they're under enough pressure. <sighs> Not the world champion. Yes, but Vini. Even the world champion. You think you've won? It doesn't look good for you here. Maybe. No more maybes, Batvinik. It's checkmate in six moves. Do you think you're ready? <laughs> I've been ready my whole life. What about you, Botvinnik? You think you're ready? Remember, seven in all of history. And now eight. That's right. And now, we will be coming after you. <laughs> Comrade Tal? No. Sir, please, call me Misha. Comrade Tal, Misha, I, I congratulate you, congratulate you. After defeating Mikhail Batvinik in the 1960 world title match, at 23, I became the youngest world champion in history. The following year, I won the title back from Tal in a rematch. After that loss, Tal never contended for the title again.
for Simon Studio presents, this is the cast of the French Defense. And gentlemen, thanks for a great performance tonight. And now that uh, before you drop from exhaustion of uh, playing all this chess, I wanted to just say a few things about how you did this, uh, this up actual production. Um, Robert? Yes, sir. Um, you told me you, uh, you, you, you've you never done an adult job your, in your whole life. Uh, Absolutely is, right. And proud of it. Yes. And uh, being an actor, this is a lot of fun. And for kids, is that, is that how you feel? Sure. You stay a kid until you die. And uh, <laughs> that's what I you've gotten through it that way. Well, it, it, it sounds to me like um, you've been doing it uh, for how 38 long? 38 years. 38, 38 years. 38 years. That's great. And um, thank the good Lord, the last... 25 of them, I've just had to do this. I, I, no more bartending or crane operating or anything like that. That's a different kind of acting. Yes, and, but you notice they're all not adult jobs. Yes, crane operator, you get to play with the crane. Where did you start? I started um, at the Actors Mobile Theater with Brett Warren. That would be back in the 60s. Hmm. And, uh, Where was that, in New York? Yes, it was at the Hotel Ansonia. Oh, my goodness. Uh, probably about two years before the uh, Continental Baths got there, and then it became Plato's Retreat. Uh, we remember it well, but we won't talk much about okay, it. But okay, but that's all right. <laughs> but that's, it was a, a fine old hotel. It's still there. I understand Babe Ruth lived there for a while. Yeah, I'm sure he did. And uh, Brett Warren had a very nice actor studio there, and I was fortunate enough to be in the same class with John Voight and Richard Castellano. Uh-huh. So we, uh, that, I got a good start. And... Did they do, didn't they do View from the Bridge? Yes. Off Broadway? Were you part of that? Yes, I was <coughs> Rudolfo for a while. Oh, with Castellano? Yeah, we all took chances. You know what? I saw that. Oh, really? I did. I enjoyed it. And uh, Did you remember me? Uh, you looked a little different then. Yeah, about uh, 30 <laughs> pounds lighter. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking good now, I have to tell you. Well, I let myself gain 15 pounds to do Botvinnik. When I started, I was a little skinny guy. Was the, was I didn't see him that way. Was this rehearsal process about eating? No, it was about learning lines and then learning chess moves and then learning which lines went with which moves. <laughs> I see. It was quite a convoluted process, to be honest uh, with it you. It sounds like uh, it was, and you had to work off this character to your left, Mr. Daniel Simon. A fine young actor, a fine young actor. He's an up-and-comer. Uh, they said, they told me he's an up-and-comer. You have to study... These historical figures, how much did you actually look into these two characters? Because they're based on real history. Uh, 1960s, Russia. Um, 1960, yeah. 1960. Right at the beginning right. of 1960s. Dan, any, anything about that? Um, yeah, I, I definitely read up on, on Mikhail Tall. It's an interesting character. The play <laughs> was not an, a biography. Right. Biograph it was not a biography for both of them in any sort of way. It uh -huh. was sort of the theatricality of it. But it was interesting to understand uh, both the real players and their backgrounds and certain things ab about them. Um, but it was not uh, it was not essential to uh, both Dimitri and Alexei um, to be true to the, the specific nature of so you could guys. personalize these these characters. We to took did. liberal yeah. poetic license right. yeah. with them. Right. Um, there are certain facts that, that are there that uh -huh. are very true about Tall. His brash game, his attacking style. Mm -hmm. um, what was fascinating about Tall? The, the situation. You, what was fascinating about the character of Tall, in pl in playing a character like that? Originally. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. Just the idea of being thrown into a situation where you have to be on par and, and prove that you're worthy of a profession. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, we can all relate to. How about you, Bob? What, what did you feel about your character that fascinated you as you worked on it? Well, right off the bat, the entire character. Mm -hmm. I'm generally your Italian gangster or your dope <laughs> addict or... You? Yeah, most kind of bad guys. <laughs> oh, gosh. And this was <laughs> nice to be able to play, like, you know, uh, a Russian of some renown. And I just found, to my way of thinking, the fatherliness of it. Mm -hmm. I'm getting onto that age now where I can find the fatherliness in a character. And this is new for me, so it was somewhat of a stretch. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed all of that. 
We've got our playwright with us for the French Defense, Dimitri Raitson. Dimitri, welcome to Thank Simon you. Studio Presents, and congratulations on a beautiful piece. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Thank you. Dimitri, this started uh, in your mind some time ago. How long ago did you dream up this, this uh, theatrical idea of, of putting these two wonderful characters together? Um, I read a book about Tao when I was in high school. And, uh, then where, was the, where were you in high school, in Russia or in America? You in America, in New uh -huh. York. Uh -huh. um, and uh, then one day I was in Washington Square Park and I was watching these two guys play and they were really trash talking each other. And all of a sudden I had this light bulb went on. Like, What would happen if the two top players, you know, chess is played in silence, but what would happen if um, they could actually talk to each other and like really say what they were feeling? Hmm. And once the light bulb went on, the play came out like in a week and a half or two weeks. It got written really fast. It was like writing, it was like taking dictation. And it I was just getting it down as fast as I could. This was your first play? It was my first play. Wow. And do you play chess? Uh, I used to play chess in high school. I mean, I shouldn't even ask. Every Russian is supposed to play chess, right? I mean, well, you're, but you're American Russian, but still. No, no, that's true. I don't remember far enough back to when I don't play chess. Uh huh. So, like, my earliest memories go to being four and five, and I play chess. I, I remember playing chess on the Black Sea with my father. So, you're, everyone in your family played it? Oh, it's like you said, everyone in Russia plays it. Right. It's like the national pastime. Here is baseball, there it's, it's, it's close to chess, I guess. I think they're teaching the maternity ward. Well, <laughs> probably, yeah. Um, where did you get interested, though, in these two particular characters rather than just the Russian chess game? You, you read about Tal? Is that the idea? And then I read a book about Tal's games uh, from his being a teenager going all the way through this match. And, uh, you know, I always, you know, just in movies or watching theater, I've always been attracted to really smart, intelligent characters. And, uh, you know, when the idea hit me, I just said, like, wow, this is so great. Mm -hmm. I get to write about two guys, you know, the top two, two chess players in the world. I mean, these are very intelligent characters. Mm, absolutely. But at the same time, as human as you and I. Yes. With the same emotions and needs and desires. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about this play is as, as smart as these guys are, they really are like you and I. And I think the uniqueness of having them talk to each other instead of what we know of chess championships where people spend hours and hours in silence. I mean, this is right. it's quite, a, quite an exciting conceit, theatrical conceit. Um, what was the process like? You first wrote this how long ago? I wrote this uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And where did you take it? Uh, I had it read at HB Studio, which is um, a great school in New York. I'm mm -hmm. in the Playwrights Unit there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, when I wrote it, it was like taking dictation. And normally, when we read something, it goes through multiple rewrites and iterations. And the feedback to me was like, don't change a thing. Mm -hmm. It's done. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I just sent it out to a bunch of uh, different places. And uh, it ended up winning an award in Iowa mm -hmm. uh, in a national one play, one act play contest. And uh, then I submitted it to a couple of festivals in New York, and it was accepted at the Samuel French Festival, and uh, where it was a finalist, and it was uh, accepted to the Fringe this summer, mm. where we just did it last month. And first it was done as a reading at HP, or you had a workshop first? Nope, first it was done as a reading. As a reading. And uh, the director was Alexei? Uh, no, no director. No. It was a cold reading. It was a cold reading. Yeah, the actors. I think the, the philosophy in the school is a cold reading gives you a truer test of how good the play is. Yeah. Because they, the feeling is that good actors will save a bad script, mm -hmm. but a cold actor will give you a truer <laughs> reading. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. I think before the director comes in, you really get something that's pure before anybody says, this is how to do it. You yeah. get the instinct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we love to do that in our Simon studio as well. I think it's a lot of, uh, uh, it, it, it seems to bring out some really good things. Well, the requirement is you need to have really good actors, which yeah. we have at HP. And to trust the instincts. Yeah. Rather. Um, so from there, 
it was done as a workshop production at HP or just a reading? It, it was just, just a reading. Okay. And, and then I sent it out into the great universe. Great wild wor <laughs> world of whatever. And, the, and yes. then the New York International Fringe Festival picked it up. Yes. And it was just done. That's right. And uh, how did it feel now taking it from the stage play and seeing it performed for television tonight just, just now? I mean, how did, how did that transformation hit you at all? Or well, I, has I, it set in yet? <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, as I was watching it done, I saw some uh, really wonderful things, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, th that you really cannot get in the theater, like close-ups. I mean, you could really get into the eyes of the actors and, and read their emotions truly on their face. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially for a play like this, which is not very action-y and really more kind of like cerebral and talky and with a lot of an inner life in the characters, um, the ability to see the actors in the close-up, I think really adds something very wonderful to it. So I was very excited to see this done. At this point, writing is taking over more and more. Uh, right. What else, what else are you doing? I used to work on Wall Street mm -hmm. for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I said, uh, time for something different. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to write full time now. Well, you know what? We're going to get you out of it. No more Wall Street. We want you writing full time, more plays. Thanks so much, Dimitri Raidson, for the French defense. And will you write another one for us, please? I'm Simon, trying. Simon Studio presents Dimitri Raidson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that was The French Defense, a play by Dimitri Raisin. And that's our show for tonight. For those of you who would like to find out more about our training and development for actors, writers, and directors that we do both in New York City and Poughkeepsie, here's where you can find us. And we'd love to hear from you about our training program and also about your reactions to our show. And from all of us at the Simon Studio, until next time, so long, everybody. Oh, bring another show in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore. A chance for stage folks to say hello. Time Warner's Poughkeepsie Live.